So today's video is gonna be a little bit different to the type of content that I would usually put out. And as you can probably tell from the title of this video, I just wanted to give my perspective as an experienced physiotherapist on the Maya Kowalski case. Despite how sad and unfortunate this story seems to be, one of the main things that pricked up my interest more than anything was the condition that Maya was labeled with, which was chronic regional pain syndrome. So as an Australian musculoskeletal physiotherapist, I was hoping to use my experiences with CRPS and hopefully draw something positive from this whole situation so that other people who may be experiencing chronic regional pain syndrome can better understand what you may be dealing with, why it occurs, and more importantly, what things that you can do, at least from a physiotherapy perspective, to hopefully push you further down that path to potentially getting past this at some stage. I was in bed with my wife this morning and she came across a video that informed us that Maya had just been awarded over $200 million in damages from the John Hopkins Hospital in Florida in the States that was pertaining to a pretty unfortunate experience for everyone involved. Ultimately, Maya presented to a hospital with quite sinister abdominal pain and disabling leg and foot pain to the point where I understand she needed a wheelchair to get around. The powers that be used their experience and expertise to determine that she may have been a victim of child abuse. They removed her from her family, which ultimately caused her mother to commit suicide. I believe there's a Netflix documentary on this specific story entitled Take Care of Maya. Again, I haven't seen it. My only understanding of this particular case was what I've been reading this morning since my wife let me know what happened. So as an Australian musculoskeletal physiotherapist with almost 20 years of experience trying to help people solve their pain, one of the really interesting things about chronic regional pain syndrome, and unfortunately this seems to be reflected quite heavily in the Maya Kowalski case, is that there's a lot of unknowns in the medical and health communities about what chronic regional pain is and how to diagnose it. And like a lot of chronic pain conditions, whether it be CRPS or fibromyalgia or other persistent forms of pain, there's still this leftover stigma that the person themselves are some way responsible for the severity of their symptoms. The idea that this can all be in your head, that your pain isn't real, or that you are somehow being untrustworthy in the presentation of your pain symptoms is something that needs to change across the board. The moment that we start giving patients the impression that we think that they are at fault, that they are doing something wrong, is also the moment that we completely invalidate how they feel. And when dealing with any form of chronic pain dysfunction, and you'll hopefully appreciate this in a second, it can be one of the single most detrimental things to do to a person with this experience. And the reason why I say that is regardless of what your chronic pain symptoms might be, if you have chronic regional pain syndrome, you may have a, a wide variety of different aches, pains, and issues that may be all types of severities from mild to extreme. And in my experience as a physiotherapist, the overt presentation that we see in terms of where your pain is and how sinister that pain may be for you is not just based on musculoskeletal dysfunction. We tend to see that a lot of chronic regional pain syndrome can develop after an acute injury. I remember about 10 years ago, I had a young girl present to me in a clinic who had just sprained her ankle. And over the course of one to two weeks, her symptoms skyrocketed. Her swelling didn't go down, it changed color. She couldn't put any pressure on her foot. But more importantly, the pain that she was experiencing was extreme. And what's really important to understand about chronic regional pain syndrome and a lot of other chronic dysfunctions for that matter, is that we absolutely need to respect the presentation in front of us. We need to respect that my patient at the time had severe pain, she had a lot of swelling, she couldn't weight bear to any major degree, but it's not her fault. She's not weak, she's not putting it on. There is a tangible reason for why she was experiencing the things that she was. And if we aren't continually open-minded as therapists and health professionals, then we're gonna miss the most important part of this conversation. It was absolutely not her fault that other health professionals and medical professionals couldn't quite put their finger on what she was going through. Her scans didn't reveal any sinister damage to her ankle at the time. So this young girl and her family were left frustrated and scratching their heads because they weren't given an accurate diagnosis of her symptoms. But beyond that, they didn't understand what was actually going on. And the reason why this is so important and the reason why we need to validate how each person with chronic regional pain feels is because most of these symptoms are not based on tissue damage, even though that is a part of the equation for some people. It is heavily influenced by how threatened and heightened her central nervous system is. And without knowing much about Maya, if anything at all, for her to be given the label of chronic regional pain syndrome, it suggests that her nervous system may also have been heightened to some degree long before she hurt herself. 
as was the case with my patient and the one or two people that I may see with chronic regional pain each year, not only is everything that they experience completely valid and real, it is often just an expression of other things that are going on in that person's life. And whatever injury may set it off just gives it a platform for that heightened nervous system to feed off. And as was the case with my patient and potentially Maya as well, how heightened someone's nervous system is before they hurt themselves can determine the reaction to that injury. Now, in order to get a broader understanding of why chronic pain can exist, we need to understand what pain actually means. And again, I talk about this on the channel all the time, but for anyone unaware, as an industry, we used to think that pain was based on tissue damage and tissue injury, where if we took a scan of your painful area, we would logically expect to see something that was broken or torn or damaged. And while this can be the case for a lot of people, it never actually explained why so many people can have intense debilitating pain, but nothing to show for it on a scan. So what we've come to understand these days is that pain is just a representation of your brain and nervous system's perception of threat. Now clearly that can encompass tissue damage and injury that can be very threatening for a nervous system, but it's not exclusive to that alone. So then as we bring chronic pain back into the mix, what chronic pain suggests, persistent pain suggests, and chronic regional pain suggests is if we think of it logically along those steps, the intensity and the persistence of someone's pain without any tangible evidence of damage or medical dysfunction that we sometimes need to hang our hat on to give someone a diagnosis, our focus shouldn't consistently be on the tissue damage or the systemic dysfunction that we're expecting people to have to underpin this issue. We instead need to focus on why someone's nervous system has been chronically heightened for long enough to create these symptoms. So like my patient a few years ago who sprained her ankle and came in with chronic regional pain syndrome, or Maya herself, or you or anyone else in the future, it's really important that we take a step back, put the pain and dysfunction aside temporarily, and try and get a better understanding of why your nervous system is heightened in the first place. And again, as I've said on the channel a lot, in the animal kingdom, a heightened nervous system, that fight or flight response is normal. It's normal for animals, it's normal for us as animals as well. But the problem with modern society and modern living is that while in the animal kingdom, that fight or flight response is often a fleeting experience. If you were to watch a lion chasing a zebra out in the wild, they'd both be in that heightened fight or flight response. One's trying to kill, the other's trying not to be killed. And that fight or flight response, that temporary heightening, acts as that temporary boost in physiology to try and make that outcome successful. But what's important to understand in that scenario is that if that lion fell over and the zebra got away, in a very short amount of time afterwards, you might find that that lion is back asleep and that zebra might be drinking calmly at a watering hole without potentially a care in the world. The idea being is that that temporary boost is very quickly followed by a temporary reduction once that perceived threat has gone. But one of the problems now as humans in this modern world is that temporary boost, that fight or flight response is no longer temporary or fleeting. It is in of itself chronic by nature. Whether you have financial stress, work stress, relationship stress, whether you have religious or cultural stress, whether you have stress from your body image or your societal expectations, or if you are someone who has unfortunately been a victim of abuse, whether that be mental, physical, or sexual, these things stick with us. Whether it's something in your past or something you are currently dealing with at the moment, chronic exposure to anything asks your body to adapt to that over time. And if you've unknowingly been telling your nervous system or had your nervous system been told to be chronically heightened for months, years, or decades, then it's gonna be very good at being heightened. So if you are dealing with chronic regional pain syndrome and you do have some physical dysfunction like my patient did who sprained her ankle, obviously you may need to do some physical rehabilitation in terms of getting that ankle stronger, supporting it with some crutches or a boot or something like that to decrease that threat perception in that specific scenario. You may have to do some balance work and some mobility work to prompt that tissue to return to normality mechanically as quickly as possible. But if we aren't addressing that chronically heightened nervous system as well, then those symptoms may be encased in a foot of concrete that we just can't influence to the degree that we want to without removing that foot of concrete at the same time. So in a way, the specific musculoskeletal presentation of your chronic regional pain syndrome is important, but that may not be the main focus that you need to have to start with in order to get those symptoms to go away. Clearly as a physiotherapist, I would never ask you to do one thing or another. If you have the motivation and the time and the energy to do a bunch of things at the same time, then please do. Do your musculoskeletal physical rehabilitation 
rehabilitation, follow the guidelines that your physiotherapist or your doctors have handed out towards you. But at the same time, try a few of the things that I'm about to go through to get that nervous system to calm down. Because if you can, it may just make everything you are trying to do, the obvious things, far more effective than they would otherwise be if we're not focusing on that foot of concrete that they're encased within. So as a physiotherapist, there's four simple things that I would recommend to my patients to try and get that chronically heightened nervous system to dial down a few gears. But before we get to these, we need to make sure that everything that you do passes through a filter that allows you to understand whether it's actually done something. Because I don't want you to waste your time with things that I or someone else may offer you up to do if it doesn't make you feel any different. And because the spirit of these techniques are there to try and help you down-regulate a heightened nervous system, it's really important that you take stock of how heightened you feel your nervous system is to begin with, focus on each one of these individual things, and then recheck in again to make sure that you feel like you've tangibly shifted down a few of those gears. And a way that I find really simple is that if you just close your eyes and try and give yourself a score out of 10 of how heightened you may feel you are. 10 being the most heightened and stressed you can possibly feel. Zero is absolutely nothing. But take stock of that, give yourself a number, and check in again after each one of these techniques. So the first thing that everybody can do is exercise. Now, if you have an injury or an issue associated with your chronic regional pain syndrome, what your exercise looks like might be different for the next person. But the great thing about the body is that you can always do something. Like my patient who had injured her ankle, clearly I couldn't get her to go for a walk or go for a run, but she was more than happy to go for a swim and put a buoy between her legs so she wasn't kicking just to get her body moving. And not only is the type of exercise important, but also the intensity and the duration. And this is really important to consider because not only is your pain, your brain and nervous system's perception of threat, that threat can represent itself in a million different ways. The things I mentioned before in terms of life stresses can be a big part of it. But if you are doing too much of something or you're going too hard at that thing, that can also be a form of threat. So for my patients, swimming was a very gentle, relaxing experience for her to do. But we wanted to focus more on the enjoyment of the experience of movement. But finding an intensity and a duration and a type of activity that feels very respectful to you and your symptoms is an amazing way to get your nervous system to downregulate. The second thing that you can try, and clinically this is a favorite of mine because of how potentially potent it can be at downregulating that heightened nervous system quickly. And all it is is just deep breathing. Now there's clearly a number of different deep breathing techniques that you can try, but the one that I get my patients to do is just simply taking a deep breath in, pausing at the top for a second or two, before relaxing and sighing on the way out. The great thing about that technique, it may only take three to five of those deep breaths to register that down regulation of your nervous system. But depending on how heightened and chronically heightened you might be, how on edge you might be as a rule, cycle through five, 10, 15, 20 of those relaxed deep breaths until you feel that tangible shifting down of a few gears. Tip number three is cold showers. Now I'm fully aware that the thought of cold showers doesn't feel very calming and relaxing and ultimately it does feel threatening. There aren't too many people that would naturally volunteer for a cold shower and then jump into a cold shower and not feel like you want to freak out and become threatened. But the key with cold showers is that not only can they be a fantastic way to reset your nervous system and cause it to calm down, but it can also be used as an exercise to practice your deep breathing and get better at down-regulating that heightened nervous system in the presence of a threat. And what I mean by that is instead of just turning the shower on cold and jumping in and hoping for the best, if you start with your regular warm shower, just take Take some calm, comfortable, deep breaths just to regulate your nervous system to begin with. Then just start to turn the temperature down of that shower to the point where it starts to feel subtly challenging. And if you can maintain that comfortable breathing pattern and stop your body from freaking out and spiking, then you'll start to realize that you can tolerate that cold for longer. And then as your body starts to adapt to that process over a few days and a few weeks, you'll naturally feel like you can keep turning down the temperature of that shower until it's completely cold and it won't feel horrible. I have a cold shower each morning and I look forward to it. It feels amazing and I love how it makes me feel afterwards in terms of my stress levels and just my quality of life as a whole. The fourth thing is lovingly called the gut smash. I posted a video on this before. This technique was popularized by Jill Miller of Yoga Tune Up and all it requires you to do is to grab a ball, place that ball into your abdomen, lie down on top of that ball and generally go hunting for anything that feels tight, tender or restricted. What this does is this can help stimulate the vagus 
nerve, which has a strong role to play in down-regulating a heightened nervous system, that parasympathetic response to the sympathetic heightening. Not only is this exercise amazing for helping you get to sleep if you do it before bed, but I challenge you to not feel more relaxed after doing this exercise. But ultimately, the point of this video is to say that if you are someone who is dealing with chronic regional pain syndrome, you are not insane, your symptoms are 100% valid, it's not good enough for a medical or health professional to challenge the validity of your symptoms. It is more of a reflection on their inability to diagnose you correctly, more so than it is your fault. The sooner we can make you feel valid with what's going on, understand that the musculoskeletal symptoms that you may be experiencing are important, but may not ultimately be the most important thing that you need to change to get through this, then we can consistently change the narrative of what chronic regional pain is, how easily it's diagnosed, and potentially how quickly we can get it under control. So I genuinely hope that was helpful. I hope that it was also appropriate that we piggybacked off of Maya's unfortunate circumstances and everything that she and her family have been through. But hopefully we can turn that into some form of a positive for other people to learn a little bit more about their condition or at least give people more sympathy for what someone else might be experiencing. So I genuinely hope that was helpful and insightful. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you in the next video.